Unemployed men in the early 1930s stealing waste coal from slag heaps in South Wales. Between the wars, many parents faced a day-to-day -day struggle to keep their children alive. We needed the coal. We had to have coal for the fire, for heating the house, and for cooking. I had to have coal because I had to bath the baby. I couldn't bath her without a fire, and I had to have the boiling water. I had to boil water for the bath. So without the fire, I was finished. Without the coal, I was finished. So I had to, we had to steal it. Families were so dependent on coal that in the poorest streets, mothers, fathers and their children would conspire to steal it, even from moving trains. And behind docks, and behind the lane was an embankment. A train had to go past there. We used to grease the lines, take the grease off the points on the line and grease the lines. That's how we used to slow it down. That frame was shouting in the street, the train come in. Yeah. Everybody come out. Like Indians, like Indians attacking their wagon train. Like the cowboys. That's just to be. Wouldn't it? Climb the bank, get onto the buffer, climb into the wagon, throw the coal out. So roll down the bank and into the back gates. Then when they when we pass the street, we jump off, come back. To put it back, you put all the coal in our in our coalaces and somebody will be argument, it's my lump. No, no, it's my lump. <laughs> the argument's like that. We'd go and get a hard cane brush and he'd sweep all the lane because the policeman, if he walked along the bank and he looked out, he could see the coal bits of coal on the floor and he know exactly which house the coal the coal would be taken into, see. So we'd all be there sweeping the back lane. Boys. Girls, women, pregnant women. She wasn't the only pregnant woman on the no, tracks. No, there was quite a few, did there? I quite don't a know. few. I didn't have far to go before the baby was born. Well, anyway, this was on a Monday. On the Wednesday, my daughter was born. And I suffered for that. Through going up for that call, I suffered for that. I was really ill. So it's a good few months before I stole any more coal again. Before the last war, around a quarter of all households lived at, or in some cases below, the most basic subsistence level. Families at the bottom of the social scale were concerned with the bare necessities of life. Parents struggled just to feed, house, and keep their children as healthy as possible. They devised extraordinary strategies to survive. Mothers in particular needed considerable skill and ingenuity to feed the family. It was very nice to have a pig's head, lovely, because I used to see it in the shops and I used to think, oh, how nice it looks. I should love some of that. The children were looking on, looking round, laughing and singing and saying, Dad, is, is it going to be nice dancing round the front room? I said, I hope it is. The butcher would clean it for me, take the eyes out. He said, do you want the brains, madam? I said, no, thank you. I said, I said I'll have the pig's head cleaned, please. He said, shall I leave the ear on? I said, yes, please. Let it boil till it simmered. Then I put a saucepan cover on the top and left it for three hours. And by that time, all the bones had come out. And when it was drained, I put it on a tin plate, took all the bones away. See, every bone was away from it. And put another tin plate on top and put the flat on top of that and left it for three or four hours to cool down. When it was cool, it was a nice pig's cheek. That's how I fed my children. And the children loved it. They said, lovely, Mum, isn't it? Lovely and soft to eat. Delicious. I said, yes, <laughs> it is. You could live for nearly a week on a pig's head. 
I don't think any young woman today would know what to do with a pig's head. <laughs> and then I think confronted with it, she'd say, ugh. <laughs> but we made brawn, we took the tongue out and boiled that and made cold tongue to eat. You took the brains out, tied them up in muslin and boiled them and spread them on mashed potatoes. Supposed to be very nourishing for a small child. And uh, sheep's heads we used to have. And cod's heads, I haven't seen a cod's head in a fishmonger's, I don't think since the war. They used to be enormous, just the head. Uh, where they chopped the head off used to be about that big. And you took the eyes out, which was rather a nasty job. But once you got the eyes out, you boiled it, and then you scraped all the fish flesh off and put it with mashed potatoes and made fish cakes. And that was enough for a meal for two and a, and a little one. My husband was a pigeon fancier. So occasionally you'd get a pigeon that had his neck wrung. So then you'd make a pie of that. I'm not going to say it was always digestible, but I don't think there was much wasted. There were days when there wasn't really much to eat. You were the person that was hungry, never the children. Because yeah, at times you'd be too sick to want to eat. Oh no, if there was two pieces of bread that was divided in four, the kids said that you didn't have it. In London alone, it's estimated that some 230,000 people live under conditions which are unfit for human habitation. In one of these streets lives Molly, her mother, two brothers and baby sister. Five of them in two rooms. The whole structure of the house is really formed to pieces. Walls and ceiling are rotting with age. The air is full of soot from a hundred choked up chimneys. A million families all over Britain had to contend with conditions like these. The floor is sinking so badly that wedges have to be put under the table legs to keep it level. In a modern farm, not even cattle would be stalled in such conditions. We only had one bed. So the children had to sleep with us in the middle of the bed, my husband one side and me the other side. And we had cockroaches in the bedroom and bugs on the wall. We'd be eating them all the time with paper and a bit brown things, wasn't it? Oh, terrible. So my brother come down and he suggested we Vaseline the legs of the bed so they wouldn't climb up to onto the children while we were downstairs. So that's what he done. And then I used to wash the floors with Jay's fluid and I, I used to go around every night uh, with a cloth off round the side of the bed and at the back of the bed to make sure there was none and get a, a mop and go up the top to make sure there was none to fall on the children while they were in the bed. My one concern was for the safety of the children. When the lights were out, your candle was blown out and you settled down to sleep, that's when the bugs started biting. Now, there were nobody more scrupulously clean than my Hetty, my wife. But we still got these bugs and you had to contend with these till they went back into the, crawl back into the nests or whatever, in the walls, the crevices of these old buildings that we had to live in decrepit as they were. We had to live in them. Most of these homes had no gas, electricity, or even running water, all of which made the everyday tasks of looking after children extremely difficult. We never had no running water, so we had to go up to the standpipe to fill the buckets with water. So I used to take two at a time and fill them up and bring it back and boil it up and bring it in a bucket into the front room and pour it into the tin bath. And the children were crying, you know, and I said, never mind, Mummy won't be long. Oh, Mummy, I'm cold, I'm cold. All right, I'll put you more further towards the fire and then you'll be warm. There was little room for furniture and the few possessions poor families had were usually very basic. 
Anything extra had to be improvised. My daughter wanted a bedside cabinet. Well, it was out of the question, buying a bedside cabinet. And I had the idea that an orange box was just the right size and properly re refurbished or refurnished would be just the job. And I, because it had a middle shelf, the old type orange box had a middle shelf. And I wallpapered it and put a curtain across an air presto, it looked like a million dollars. Mothers in poor neighborhoods often had to borrow essential items. Women relied on a day-to-day -day system of sharing and favors to keep their families going. It's nothing to see some of uh, the women at the back pouring over walls. Sugar, tea, cotton, needles, everything like that is always borrowed. We'd never be afraid to ask for anything. We'd always have it. Whether it was money, food, or even clothes. I have seen people borrowing, can I borrow your coat to go to, go to town? Or can I borrow your Mac? And they'd lend it. I was glad I've helped many a time. I've got to be honest with her. If I thought so, his mother wanted something, I would give it to her. Or if she thought I wanted something, she'd give it to me. And everybody else was the same. Everybody would help everybody else. Gangs of children also played an important role in helping parents and other families to get the bare essentials of life. This frequently involved turning to crime. I used to go nicking from the shops with all the other kids because poverty was rife. Just food, you know, biscuits. Tins of salmon, tins of corned beef, anything he could eat, eggs, because he's bloody hungry. Well, the parents knew that the kids were thieving because he'd fetch things in that they knew very well they couldn't buy. And they'd go and sell them, you see, or they'd go and help a neighbour out, they'd go and give a neighbour a couple of blankets that had been knocked off, or they'd go and take some tins of corned beef. And sometimes he used to tell the sons what they wanted, they'd give them a shopping list, can you nick this, can you nick that? Your dad needs some working boots. Well, he used to have working boots hanging outside pawn shops, a big string of them. And as you pass, you got your pen knife out and cut a pair off the bottom. The police used to come down the streets. They'd been tipped off that some kids had raided the stores. And they used to make these periodic searches in the houses when things were knocked off. But that was an accepted part of life. It was a game, you see. If you got caught, tough luck. I didn't know a chance, there was that many at it. It was an essential part of the economy, a gang. Without a gang, the street would just deteriorate. If you obeyed the strict letter of the law and was a good Christian, you'd starve to death. If you followed Christ, you'd end up getting crucified. So you had to be a villain, you had to duck and dive and scheme and thieve, pinch things. It was a matter of survival. The battle for survival was often most desperate in families where the main breadwinner was unemployed for several years. There were over a million families in this position in the 1930s. The parents often found that the dole money they received simply wasn't enough to feed themselves and their children. Very often the, the money ran out by Monday and I can remember walking to the unemployment exchange on a Thursday morning when we got them the money, pushing my small daughter in a pram, walking with my husband. And when I saw him coming down the stairs, knowing he'd got the dole in his pocket, I used to rush into the baker's, which was next door, and get three halfpenny rolls, give one to the baby, one to myself, and wait for him to come in the bakers to pay for them. By the time we'd got to the door, we'd eaten half of it. Behind these doors and windows, a family is being kept alive on a little more than a shilling a day for each person. So what did I do? I improvised by taking in washing and ironing. Many of them may never work again. You'd probably do a bit of knitting for someone a bit of sewing for someone. And this all had to be done without the dull people knowing. 
And then one day we had a runt pig given to us. We fed that pig. It didn't really cost us anything at all because we had scraps. People were glad to give them to you out of the way. Then we sold it for five pounds. But hardly had we got the money in our hand before somebody had reported it to the dole people and our dole was stopped for a month. Even though they risked prosecution, parents on the dole were often forced to take secret part-time jobs in order to support their families. Dole was only 25 and threepence a week for three of us. So you had to find means of supplementing that income, even if it made men doing something that wasn't legal. And one of the jobs I used to do was caddying. If it hadn't been for caddying, probably not have been even survived. And you only got a shilling around or two bob around at the most, which took about three hours to walk around the golf links. And as soon as you come back, you go out again. Sometimes with two bags on your shoulder, which were good because yeah, that was a double fee, wasn't it? I was always running a risk if I was caught being taken to court and probably I'd be sent down, maybe for three months, which was usually about the minimum for an offence of that kind. Because they knew it went on, you see, and we knew we run this risk. But we, I won't say we were happy to run that risk, but we run it. Through its employment exchanges, the Ministry of Labour is contributing to the solution of this problem. In 1931, the means test was introduced. Albert Lee. It was designed to catch out so-called scroungers. Make yourself comfortable, put your cap on the back of the chair. Now you're Albert Lee, you live at 6 Lakeland Avenue, Seacliff Whitehaven, is that right? Yes, sir. You're 21 years of age, you weigh about 10 stone 8, and you've been working at the colliery as a haulage head, is that right? Yes, sir. And I think there were rigorous checks on all claimants. They were subjected to humiliating interviews which delved into the most intimate details of their private and family life. Most feared of all was the home visit. Well, Albert, you know what it means. It means... Somebody came to your house and made you dispose of what they considered to be superfluous to your needs. Now, is that quite satisfactory to you? Yes, sir. So, he had a good look round, opened drawers, cupboards, even counted the teacups. And finally, in disgust, he said, three in the family, you've got four chairs in here, get rid of one of them. I think we got two shillings for it. The subsistence lifestyle of the slums meant that the children were extremely vulnerable to serious ill health, disease and disability. Children from poor families were ten times as likely to suffer from rickets, pneumonia and bronchitis as children from professional homes. But many couldn't afford to pay for the doctor and turned instead to a whole range of home cures and remedies. When my children had up and cough, my mother told me to take them down the road because the men were tar spraying the road and it would uh, help them with their breathing. So I put them in the pram and they said, where are we going, mummy? I said, just down the road, my love. See the men spraying the road with the tar. He said, don't sir, get too near. I said, well, I said, they got up and cough. Oh, he said. Why don't you take him up to the machine, he said, up the road. He said, it's better there. He said, it's tar, when they open the top, it all comes out, he said, and they'll be able to smell it better. So that's what I done. I took them down every day regular. And uh, my mother said, they don't seem to be coughing so bad now, Rose. So I said, no, I said, I done what you told me. One of the remedies for a bad chest was goose grease. You used to put it on on a piece of brown paper and stick it on under the vest, the child's vest, and that was considered good for a bad chest. The doctor would normally only be called out in an emergency. Even then, the care and advice given was often inadequate and mothers were left to their own devices. 
Ivy Summers' second daughter was born with a cleft palate. So the doctor said, well, this baby won't live. She might live an hour, or she might live the clock round, 24 hours, he said. But he said, don't bother about her. Just put her in the bedroom and just wet her lips and leave her. So I said, what? He said, well, she'll die within a, perhaps a couple of days. So any road, with that he went. My sister was there, so I said, go to the chemist and fetch a bottle and a tin of milk. When she fetched it, I said, bring a pair of scissors, cut the top off the bottle, just the top end, a little bit off the top. I said, and go downstairs and make her a drink with the Nestle's milk. She said, oh, don't do that, she says, she'll choke. I said, just do as I tell you. So I held her up and I, I kept dropping the milk down her throat like, and we kept her alive like that for a year. And it wasn't until she was te just turned a year that uh, we was at my mother's and my father had just come in from sea and he fetched some soles and I just peeled a bit off like that and we just go in the fork, you know, and I said, she picked it up and put it in her mouth and ate it. I said, I said, she can eat. And after that, we fed her. She ate. I said, and we never had no bother after that. She ate anything. Some parents with disabled children made great sacrifices to pay for medical treatment. Hilda Bennett's son was born deaf. Every time I took him, it cost me half a crown to see the doctor. And uh, I did a part-time job to pay for it. I used to go down the dock working on the fishnet. And the lady next door, she used to let a minute from school and look after them until I came home or till the dad came home. We had to do without other things. We never had a holiday or anything like that. Parents faced pressure to place disabled children in institutions. I didn't want him sent to an institution. We didn't want to part with him. We thought too much about him. We wanted to look after him ourselves. He was our child and he was our responsibility and nobody else's. And we used to wear lip read to him and talk to him very slowly. We used to uh, tell him bread, tea, sweets, and we used to repeat it and repeat it until he got it. And that's how we learned him to talk. Despite the efforts of poor parents to care for their children, only one in five lived to adulthood. Many were so weak and sickly they died from infections, like pneumonia. When my daughter was two and a half, she was very ill. So I called the doctor and he said she had pneumonia. He said, the best thing you can do is bring your single-size bed downstairs and you will have to sleep beside her in an armchair and keep the fire going all night. He said, and I want you to wake up every hour or so and give her these tablets and something to drink. And that's how it went on for about uh, three weeks to a month. And then all of a sudden my little girl started screaming, saying, Mummy, I'm falling, I'm falling. Oh, Mummy, quick, I'm falling. So I caught hold of her and I hugged her close. I grabbed her out the bed and I walked up and down the floor with her. And I held her tight like this. I said, you're not, you're not, you're not. Mummy got you, mummy got you. And uh, then after that, she seemed to fall asleep. And I sent, and my mother sent for the doctor. Well, you know, she phoned him up and he came. He said, I'll be there at once. And he came and he said, your little girl had the crisis. He said, what we call a crisis. He said it would have killed her or, or 
brought her round. He said, and you saved her life. Rosie was my youngest sister. She was a lovely baby. She was, And when she was four years old, one day she wasn't very well. And when Dad came in from work, he said, I think we'll take her to the doctors. And that was very unusual because people didn't go to the doctors unless it was very important. And when he brought her home, she seemed a bit better. And then we went to bed. And as she wasn't well, Dad said she'd better sleep in their room on the little bed that they had at the side. And when we woke up in the morning, I couldn't believe it. I could hear someone crying, but it wasn't children. It, it was a man crying. And I'd never heard it, and it was a dreadful noise. So I got out of bed and I stood on the landing and I saw my mum and she had her old brown apron on over her nighty. She wasn't dressed and all her eyes were red and she was crying. And I said, Mum, what's the matter? And I could hear my dad crying as well. And Mum said, Rosie's dead. No one could do anything. So she said, get yourselves ready for school. So we got up and we got ready for school and we went off to school. And when I got home, no sound of my mum singing. She always used to sing. Used to hear her singing when she was cooking the dinner for us. But it was all so quiet. And after that, right until the day of the funeral, it was all so quiet. And she never sang. And she never sang again. Every month that the slums continue can be measured in the appalling physical effects of slum life. The slow undermining of the constitution, the dull hopelessness bred by filthy, verminous surroundings. During the interwar years, the life expectancy of men living in the depressed areas was just 45. The early death of fathers added to the financial problems faced by their families. In 1933, when the old fella died, things got rough for my family. The old girl was left with a pension of 21 shilling a week to keep three of us on. So eventually we fell behind with the rent and we had to do a moonlight flit. I was in school one day. The teacher said he wanted in the school playground, Raymond. So I went outside, my mother was there. She gave me this note. She said, that's the address where you go when you leave school. Don't go back to Wood Street. I said, OK, ma'am. And I went to these two rooms in Peel Green, about two miles away from Wood Street. And when I went back down Wood Street to play with a the gang, they'd ask me, where, where are you living now, Ray? And I didn't tell them. Strict instructions from my mother not to breathe a word where I lived, in case the debtors traced us. I wanted to finish playing with them. I used to stand on the corner and look round and see he wasn't following me because I'd have told the mothers where he was and that had been curtained. Lily Felstead's husband, Jack, died from a heart attack at the age of 38, leaving her to bring up four young children. She depended on her sister to care for them while she worked in a local hotel. And I used to leave home about quarter past six in the morning and get there for about seven o'clock in the morning, cycling there. And then uh, I worked until probably half past five at night. But it was good to work because not only did she pay me a wage, she also gave me lots of things to bring home for the kids. And I'd been there about five or six weeks and I think she was getting a bit concerned because I was losing so much weight. And now I was down to five stone two. Because you were wondering how things were at home, whether my sister was there, whether they were being looked after, if they'd gone to school, if my brother was looking after them again, if he, you know, all kind of things like that, that you really should have been at home looking after them. Lily felt her sister was seriously neglecting the children. They were suffering through 
having to look after themselves, wash in cold water in the winter time, do things that only a man or a woman should have had to do. My brother caught me accidentally with the laundry that he was bringing in, and hard to believe looking at me now, but I was only very small. And we had a, an open fireplace, and the kettle on the hob was always boiling. And as he caught me, I fell against the fire. And to stop myself from falling on the fire, I thought I was grabbing the side of the fireplace, and I grabbed the kettle. And it went all down the side of me and burnt all side. I was in hospital seven weeks. The next thing, this woman come, and she said that uh, she was there was no way I was a fit mother if I would go out and leave children. So I said, well, what do you want me to do? Do you like other people do? I said, I am not bringing them up on charity. Lily was determined to provide for her children and avoid the shame of parish relief. My mother was a very, very independent lady. No way, but no way, would she ask anyone for anything. And she was not going to have us brought up on charity. No way. So consequently, she had to go to work. That was when the mental stress really got me down. I was worse off then, mentally and physically, than I was before. We never wanted her to go to work. We would obviously have loved her to have been at home. But she, she just had to go. She was such a proud lady. She really was. Your mind was going. It was as simple as all that, with all the anxiety of all this. And then suddenly you snap, don't you? You know, you just... Without... You, because you've no one to talk to, have you? I used to say to Mum, Please, don't go to work today. Please stay at home. Look after us. Please. And it was then that I decided that I was going to find a job where I could work and yet be at home to see them to school and be there when they come back. So I went sick visiting. The children of today are the parents of the next generation. Unless these breeding places of dirt and disease are swept away, what sort of generation will it be? Are we going to perpetuate a C3 race? Those in power feared that poverty was undermining national strength and efficiency. In the 1930s, more and more local councils introduced welfare schemes to improve the health of children and counter malnutrition. The poorest children were offered free school meals. Because of the poverty of their parents, cannot be fed properly at home. So we make sure they will have at least one good meal every school day by providing a free midday dinner for them. The free dinners, you used to think about them doing your lessons, looking at the clock, half past 11, another, another 15 minutes, and we're getting stuck into a new potatoes, fish and parsley sauce, and a spotted dick. And you couldn't get out of your mind, you was that hungry. You couldn't concentrate on your lessons, you couldn't assimilate any knowledge when you was hungry. But once you'd had your dinner, and it was a real good dinner, then it, it was better. Families are moving out. Neighbours watch impatiently. It'll be their turn next. They too will pile their belongings on handcarts and leave without a backward glance. The single biggest improvement in health and living standards came from the massive slum clearance schemes, which in the interwar years moved one and a half million families into new homes built by local councils. Mermaid Court, one day with all the other Mermaid Courts, will be just a bad memory. So were I glad to get out there, away from all that, the bugs and the rats and the cockroaches. Oh yeah, I was. A vista of new life opens up. These modern council homes in the suburbs transformed family life for those moving out from the slums. Instead of a bug-infested cellar, an airy bedroom. Instead of a backyard tap, a bathroom. I couldn't believe my eyes. I walked from room to room. The children, they were as pleased as anything. They said, Mum, they were dancing about with me, upstairs and downstairs, looking at the bedrooms. They said, which is mine, Mum? And I said, you can have that one, and John will have to have that one in there. 
So I said, and this is Mum, is, I said, in, in here. They said, oh, all right, Mum, that's lovely. So they said, can we sleep by ourselves? I said, yes, you, you will have to sleep by yourself. I said, you won't be able to come in to Mummy and Dad, Daddy no more in our bed. You will have to sleep in your own beds. <laughs> so they were as pleased as anything to know that they had their own bedrooms. It was like going to heaven. Of course, the next 12 months then were spent in getting this garden ship shape. But hard work and the will to, to win in that respect created a nice garden. Lawn back and front, and flower beds. There was room to play there if she wanted to play with her mates. There was that, that garden. And this is what she did. So we came downstairs and they were delighted with the front room we had. So we could all sit together and, you know, and listen to the radio and everything in that one room. And I went, through the kitchen into the bathroom and seen what a lovely bath there was as well. I was amazed. <laughs> when they were in the bath, I used to put two in at the time to bath them and uh, do it quicker. And uh, then they used to play about in the bath. They used to say, we love this, Mum. I say, I love it as well. <laughs> so everything was nice, wonderful about it, beautiful. It was utopia. Felt like a millionaire. And we were all all like that, you see. We'd all come from the same surroundings, transported into lovely surroundings. And uh, life was different. We had electric, which we never seen before. You know, it's like go just put a switch on, the light will come on. It's amazing it was. No candles to buy, <laughs> no paraffin to buy. There was only one big regret for the parents and children moving out from the slums. The new council estates often took no account of the close family and community links which had been built up over many years. So they came down and we asked them would they put us all in the one street and they promised us yes they would but they never did. They broke their word to us. We weren't neighbours, we were one family. Yeah. And that is the truth. We were like one family. And if those men who shifted us all over the estate knew what sort of a street it was, they would have certainly have put us in the one row, which they, they never done. We had to buy coal then. That was how I broke our hearts, I did. <laughs> we had to buy coal. Imagine us, Dock Street people buying coal. <laughs> it's uh, heartbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> 